now obviously the scene is very different and uh, deep learning is everywhere. Uh, so the people at Dropbox have been nice enough to host this event. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, we've got three great speakers. Uh, I guess I'm included in that. So uh, for tonight, uh, so three great talks. And um, I wanted to introduce uh, David Kriegman from uh, Dropbox. Uh, I was going to say a little bit about Dropbox and uh, kick it off. I'll, I'll keep this sort of brief. Uh, welcome to Dropbox, everybody. Uh, really glad to have me up here. Glad to see a bunch of new faces from outside of Dropbox and a bunch of faces from within, within Dropbox. Um, Dropbox, I mean, most people know about Dropbox, use Dropbox. Um, why does Dropbox care about machine learning? Well, you know, we really focus on trying to unleash the world's creative energy. And to do that, we need to be able to understand people's content. We to uh, uh, understand what people are doing, their activities on Dropbox, and help people do the job they want to do, free up people from the burdens that they have. And in turn, what that means internally is that we work on a variety of different machine learning problems. Some of those can be lumped into the broad area of content understanding, understanding and applying NLP, applying image understanding, applying video understanding. Uh, parts of it are doing developing machine learning models inside the uh, the user interface, so you can suggest names of uh, files that you want, for example, the doc scanner, um, to uh, predict what file you might want to open next. So things like this make the workflow faster, remove treasury, and it work and allow people to work faster. Um, exciting area right now, we, we apply a whole range of techniques to, to solve these, these problems. Um, and like other Companies, we are certainly looking to hire people, so if you are out looking for it, spread the word, or if you're actually out looking for it, come up and talk to somebody else who's got a Dropbox badge on. Send me an email at dropbox.com. So happy to talk to you afterwards. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to kick things off with a short 10 to 15 minute speech here uh, about unifying theory and practice and deep learning. Uh, and this is kind of an interesting topic. Um, just real quick about me, uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm a freelance uh, software developer focused on helping companies with machine learning. Uh, previously, I was co-founder of Ersatz Labs uh, and Black Lab Business Solutions Group. I'm also an organizer of this uh, meetup. Uh, anybody who wants to email me, my email address is there uh, on Twitter and uh, address my blog, which I very much need to update. So there's a popular meme going around, and that is this idea that deep learning works, but we're not sure why. And you can see it in headlines and blogs and news who say, when AI goes wrong, we won't be able to ask it why. Uh, the dark secret at the heart of AI, and it's really small, but no one really knows how the most advanced algorithms do what they do. It sounds scary. Of course, Elon Musk, issues a start warning about AI and how it's a bigger threat than North Korea, because of course. Uh, so is AI out of control and we should all be concerned, or is there more to that story? Uh, and the reality is, is that the, uh, shall we say the theory is not caught up to the practice, right? So um, now that is exactly what people say to those reporters that then go write those articles. So I just want to clarify what I mean by that. Uh, and why it's not as scary as it sounds. Uh, so if we want to start with kind of the practice, right? Well, what's working right now, right? Because that's what people say. Well, how are you going to be able to use machine learning if you don't understand the theory behind how it works? So you can go and you can look at ImageNet. And for those of you who don't know, ImageNet is kind of a standardized data set that's been put together with a tremendous amount of images that are labeled. And anybody in the world can submit a, a algorithm to try to win ImageNet. And each year they have a competition. And each year people do a little bit better uh, on that competition. So this is 2017, uh, most recent. And uh, there's a team out of China that is currently uh, first place. And you can go right down. You can say, OK, well, what are they doing, right? And, and basically what they're doing is they're doing image augmentation, which has been around for a while. They're using uh, adaptive attention, which is newer, but also not uh, tremendously complex. They're using convolutional nets, which have been around for a while. 
They're using residual nets, which are also something that's been around for a couple of years now that is actually a big help. But uh, I guess my point is, is that the things that are winning are essentially uh, perfections of things or continued perfections that have, they've been doing already, right? Uh, so, so let's drill into ResNets, uh, for example. Where, and this is what I'm saying is, the idea for a ResNet started with this idea that, okay, we've got very deep neural networks, but if we keep adding layers past a certain point, it suddenly gets harder to train. But more layers must mean better, right? Or not? And so there was some debate, okay, well, is there a way we can figure out to train these networks with you know, many, many more layers. So okay, maybe we could use a different type of activation function. You know, so they try that. You could use a different type of initialization. Uh, you can use an entirely different type of architecture. Like there's all these different tweaks. But then somebody says, hey, let's try skip connections, right? So what's a skip connection? Well, a skip connection is, is just this extra set of weights right here. So you have your inputs skipping. These are still going through this weight layer. And then these are combined by adding them together at the end. And the idea is that the network can theoretically learn to modulate the signal that's coming in through this pathway and this pathway, and having that dynamic, adding that dynamic, uh, just makes it more intuitive. And that, that's kind of how I've explained it to people, how I've had it explained to me. It is okay, but it's pretty hand wavy. Right? It's like, well, okay, yeah, we added more layers, and now it's easier to train than it was before because we added these skip connections. But that doesn't really explain everything. So, so this is a good example where, uh, and it, but you can see that, I, I mean, and this is another just ranking of you know, different methods, and I mean, ResNets are kind of state of the art. So, so part of the answer is, well, if you're not using ResNets already, you should try it. You should try it. But it would be helpful to know why it worked. And how does the theory then catch up with that? Um, now, part of this is kind of cool because you can go to uh, the internet. You can download TensorFlow. You can download Keras. You can download PyTorch, and you can get set up with models that are pretty much state of the art. And you can throw your data at it. And there's lots of online tutorials and a lot of information that will help you get there. So, in many ways, deep learning has never been more accessible than it is today. Uh, and yet. It's easy to get to a point where you have 80% of the solution, but you're stuck on the final 20%. And then the question is, okay, well, where, where do you go from there? Uh, and part of that is tools for debugging. And tools for debugging, when it comes to machine learning, really break down to visualization tools. So you, know, you can have your standard dashboards where you have a loss, and you're monitoring that, and maybe you're looking at the norms of the weights as they change, you look at the gradient norms, and the, you know, these are just standard charts. But another interesting thing that you can look at is looking at the loss landscape of neural networks and how they vary. So this is a paper that came out at the end of last year, and even though it doesn't, um, none of these visualizations are new in the sense that they didn't invent like a new technique per se. Uh, there's a normalization technique that's kind of new, but Fundamentally, they're reporting on information we know already, right? But they're taking it and then they're applying it to trying to solve the problem of uh, why do skip connections help a resonant, all right? And the intuitive visualization that they end up with uh, is on the left, we have uh, without skip connections, and then on the, on the right, we have with skip connections. And the idea is that, hey, intuitively, this is a way to show that um, the sharpness is correlated with uh, essentially poor minima, right? So if you show it something and it gets it right, if you show it something slightly different, it's not going to generalize as well. You know, so something that's navigating this type of space isn't going to generalize as well. Whereas in this type of space, you're dealing with a much flatter structure. This is a 2D representation of kind of the same thing and kind of illustrates the larger point of, I'm just going to get on the other side here. Um, so this is 20 uh, connections with no shortcut connections. So, you know, 20 layer network, no shortcuts. So you can kind of see that this uh, manifold is relatively navigable, but you double the number of layers, you go up to 56 layers, and suddenly it's much, much noisier. 
and you go up to 110 and you know it's more of the same so so these become much harder to optimize which fit with what people see which is hey you know these networks are really hard, hard to optimize when you have 110 layers or 56 layers um, but then if you add skip connections and you turn it into a resnet uh, you know at 20 again it's kind of similar it can deal with it but it starts to really matter when you get up into the higher levels of dimensions here um, now what does this prove empirically you know is, is this you know, it's, it's a useful way to visualize what's going on and how, with neural nets, they can operate a little bit differently than more uh, traditional lower dimensionality uh, classifiers. Um, right, so this is broadly useful, and this is kind of the way they presented in the paper. They actually do, you know, several other comparisons, uh, you know, with different methods. But the idea is, you know, hey, here's a visualization technique you can use to compare a lot of different classifiers and a lot of different architecture types, uh, kind of apples to apples. And, and that's something that there really needs to be more of. So there's kind of this larger question of, all right, so are we like at a downslope then? Has, you know, do we ha not have enough theory? And that's getting in the way of results, you know, and that is somehow impeding the progress and pace of research. And, you know, I'm not really seeing that. So like, ImageNet, again, is not a perfect proxy for, like, just because your algorithm wins ImageNet does not mean it's suddenly, like, the best general purpose algorithm. But it is a pretty good proxy for just kind of looking at how quickly things are changing. Um, in 2017, the same team won this portion. They got that number down to 2.6, uh, which is actually, yeah, you can't see it right there, but it's the third research institute of the Ministry of Public Security in China uh, currently has the best uh, machine learning models for image recognition. Uh, the Chinese government. Um, go figure. Uh, so, you know, there is kind of this open question of based on the changes uh, to, uh, that we're seeing historically each year, uh, where's the next thing in machine learning and in deep learning particularly going to be? Is it going to be a new classifier? Is it going to be better nonlinearities? Is it going to be some kind of new architecture? And I really think it's going to be kind of more of the same, but a little bit different. See, because to say more of the same doesn't give it enough credit. It's going to be different, but it's still going to be compnets. It's still going to be relus or something that looks very close to it. Uh, and I think there's something to residual nets where uh, that concept of using skip connections in interesting ways and then combining them in, later into the architecture uh, is going to stick around for a while. Um, and I think what we see you know, in research is basically what I think of as the organic shotgun approach, which is essentially come up with an idea, work on that idea a little bit. If you get any traction on it, do more of that. If you don't, do less of it. And that's kind of a dumb search algorithm, but it's actually a pretty good search algorithm when you don't know very much about the space that you're navigating and you're trying to find new solutions. So theory will have to continue to catch up to practice, and that is okay. Thank you. How close it? Okay. Uh, hi everyone. My name is Tom Burr. Uh, welcome to Dropbox. I work here on the machine learning team, and um, I'd like to talk about the machine learning pieces that are behind the Dropbox Doc Scanner. Um, yeah, it's. it's there's no real theory, it's, it's all applied. It's, uh, I hope there's something for everyone here. There's some, some really old school computer vision, there's some new neural network stuff, some things in between. Uh, but let's start, for those of you who don't know, just saying what the doc scanner is. It's, um, it's yes? A little closer? All right. Um, right, the, so, so the doc scanner is a feature of the Dropbox mobile app that lets you get your physical paper documents into Dropbox as a PDF. And just to show you what it looks like, here's the app. There's this uh, the plus button on the bottom for, for adding things to your Dropbox. Uh, come on, right. Tap that. Say you want to scan a document. It'll bring up the camera. Look for that receipt. We'll, we'll detect it. Take a photo. We clean it up, remove shadows, improve contrast, and let you save it as a PDF. And if you are a Dropbox business customer, we will also run an OCR on it and embed the text into the PDF so that then um, you can search, right, and it should come up. And, uh, and you can also sort of copy text out of the PDF and 
paste it wherever you want or make a phone call, whatever you want. Um, so that's the idea. Uh, and I'm going to take you through how it works, at least sort of the ML parts of it. This is the, the basic pipeline from the camera to a PDF, right? Uh, you take a picture, we detect the document in it, and we kind of square up the image um, to get a nice rectangle. Uh, then we do some enhancement to remove shadows and improve contrast, things like that. Um, I'm actually barely going to talk about that part at all, but we can talk about it later if you want to. Um, there's not so much machine learning in that part, but there is a lot of cool sort of image processing and signal processing and stuff. And then finally, the, the OCR part to recognize the text and put that into a PDF. Um, so let's start at the beginning. Uh, document detection. You, you get an image in like this. Uh, basically, the detection algorithm is find a bunch of lines in the image and then choose four of those lines that make a good rectangle, and that's your document. In a little bit more detail, uh, these are the four steps. Edge detection, then finding the lines, finding the corners, and then choosing the final quadrilateral. Um, yeah, just to the, the, the first two might sort of seem like the same thing, finding the edges or finding the lines. Just the distinction we're making there is uh, when we talk about edge detection, it's sort of for each pixel of the image saying, kind of, is this an edge or is it not? Just on a pixel per pixel by pixel basis. And then the line is kind of this higher order structure of a whole bunch of edge pixels next to each other, you know, straight. Um, so starting off with edge detection, Right, so, so this is the uh, old-fashioned computer vision part that I mentioned. Um, edge detection is an old classic problem. Um, the best known edge detector is the candy edge detector. It's from the 80s or even before maybe. Um, and it just kind of looks at the difference in pixel intensities for, for nearby pixels. And if you run it on an image like this, you get something like this. On the screen you can hardly even see it. Sorry, okay, it showed up. Right. I moved ahead one right. So you can hardly even see these document images. <laughs> so in its own terms, the candy edge detector is working. It's finding all these high contrast text edges, but those are not the edges we want, right? We want these, which you can hardly see. So in this case, and what sort of happened a lot with this project, we found that if you just use this standard off-the-shelf stuff, it's not really built for your use case. Um, so we did have to train our own machine learning-based edge detector. Um, and this was, it's not a neural network, it's, it's a random forest. We just got a bunch of images, um, labels, the edges of all the objects in them. We didn't need that much, we had like 500 images um, trained up a random forest. And it works pretty good and it's pretty fast so it can run on the phone. Um, yeah, I won't get into too much detail there, but again, we can talk about it if you like. Uh, the next step is going from just these, this edge map, which gives you like a, an edge intensity at every pixel, to, um, to the lines in the image. And uh, yeah, it's a kind of a cool technique for this, which I want to describe. So, so here's a line, um, and this is in the XY plane, which is just like your image. And to describe the line, you, uh, you have an equation, right, or just two parameters, y equals ax plus b. If you have the slope and the intercept, you describe it. So for each line in this XY image space, you can map a point the A, B space, right, that corresponds to that line. And similarly, if, if you look at any point on your image, you can think about what that corresponds to in the A, B space. And the way you do that is imagining all the lines that could go through that point, right? And if you do that, you see that actually, just like a line in the X, Y space corresponds to a point in the A, B space, a point in the X, Y space is a line the AB space. And so the way, you, the way you use this is look at your image. Remember, we have these edge pixels. Just look at all of your edge pixels. Each of those is a point in the image. And plot all the lines that that point would be a part of. And if you do that, you find they all intersect at this one point in the AB space, which is the actual line that was in your image. That's the A and the B. Um, it gives you the line kind of as, a, as an object, as those two uh, what it looks like in practice, here's an image. This is just exactly that plot. We decided to kind of, we draw every line there. The intersection points are brighter. And so you just pull those out, and those correspond to the lines in the image. OK. 
Okay? So we got the lines, the corners, that's easy, just look at all the intersections of your lines. We, we throw a few of them out. If they're sort of very far from 90 degrees, they're probably not the corner of a piece of paper. Get rid of those. And then we just kind of consider every possible quadrilateral you can get from those corners. Right? Look at them all, and for each one, you can integrate the strength of the edge going around the quadrilateral and pick your strongest quadrilateral on that basis. That's the idea. Uh, we made uh, a little sort of test app to, to convince ourselves that it worked and that it was fast enough. So that was the video. This is the output of our trained head detector. Then, right, the Huff transform. This technique of, of moving into the AV space is called the Huff transform. It's an old classic technique. Um, it looks like this, which is kind of cool. And then you can project those back into the image space to see the lines. Either the video is a little slow or I'm talking a little too fast. Uh, then you get the corners. And so you can see like there's a lot of sort of candidate quadrilaterals you could consider, but you do this scoring. And you know, if, if someone's taking a photo of this document, it's gonna score high according to this metric, and we can usually find it. Um, cool. So, so that's the first part of this. You take a picture, we find the quadrilateral, then to rectify it, we just uh, sort of apply the projection to, to turn that quadrilateral into a rectangle. Um, the next step is enhancement. Yeah, if you look at sort of what you get out of that initial process, it's not really what you want in your PDF, right? There might be shadow. This was actually a white piece of paper, but these pixels are not white, right, because of the lighting. Um, you have this little sort of artifact around the edge. So we, we have a process, which I won't get into, but it's just to sort of clean all that up and get something like this. So it really kind of looks like something produced on a computer rather than a photo or a piece of paper. Um, cool. So now kind of the cool part, I think, is, is the OCR, right? You have this PDF. Um, it's in your Dropbox. To make it really usable, um, what, what David, uh, sorry, the first day David Kriegman was talking about um, in terms of uh, content understanding and be able, making people more able to exploit their content in Dropbox, uh, we need to understand the document as text and not just as a PDF with an image pushed into it. So we want to build OCR. We want to use OCR. Um, it was kind of a big investment, so we did consider just using some external thing. Um, if you've looked into it, the the best known open source version is something called Tesseract. Um, it's actually gotten a lot better since we originally evaluated it. It's kind of been brought up to date, but it's still fairly picking up what kind of input you give it. And so you have to be, you have to do a lot of work up front. It, it's basically, it's more, it's designed around like scanned documents, which are pretty clean already. Um, and it's, our problem is a little bit harder because people are just sort of taking photos with their phone outside or indoors in the dark. Um, it didn't work as well for us. We also considered uh, there's some commercial products. We, we initially launched, we actually licensed something just to try it out and kind of prove out the product. But um, it's, it's hard to customize you. You, know, you can't change it to do exactly what you want. If you want to add new languages, you have to pay more for them. Um, it was a little bit limited, limiting. So we did decide to build our own. I guess based also on these last points, it seemed like there was a real opportunity to build something good um, because of all the stuff, all the advances in deep learning in general and image recognition in particular. And even in more particular, we hadn't seen a lot of work on uh, using deep networks for OCR of documents, but there had been a lot of work on what they call scene text, which is um, you know, recognizing the text in non-document images, reading street signs, um, Google put out this uh, street street view house number data set, which has all the little pictures of house numbers that they use to build their maps. So um, we, we saw sort of an opportunity to build something good there, and we took it. Um, I think my remote is disconnected.
There we go. I'll try not to get too far, I guess. Um, okay, so the, the OCR system has a, a little pipeline of its own. Um, we, we take in the image from the previous step, uh, detect the, the words on the page, um, put little boxes around them. Each little image goes through a deep network that we train to actually produce the text. And, um, and then we do some post-network pre-processing sort of based on a, a dictionary to clean up little spelling errors or spacing errors or stuff like that. Um, so I'll talk about each of those three pieces. If I can, there we go. Um, so the first part, just detecting the words on the page. Here, here's an example of uh, the kind of image that we would take in. Um, the, the word box detection is based on another uh, sort of older, not as old, computer vision, vision technique called uh, maximally stable extremal regions, which is basically just a, uh, a quite fast algorithm for finding all the little blobs of pixels that are all substantially darker than all the pixels on its boundary, or substantially lighter than all the pixels on the boundary, which is a, a little uh, convoluted. But if you run it, you find it, it really picks up text very well. Um, it picks up a few other things as well, shadows along the edges, but it doesn't miss a lot of text, so it works well for us. And then it's just some clustering. You can put a box around each of them. We, uh, we figured out a metric that allows us to cluster the boxes into lines, and um, then to split the lines up into words. Uh, the lines are pretty fine here, you can sort of see them. But we just sort of look for the, the big gaps between the letters. And um, it's definitely not perfect. Uh, for one thing, we, we really didn't want to miss anything at this stage because if we miss it here, we're never going to be able to pick it up again. So we kind of tuned this to, um, to include some false detections rather than missing actual text. And the word breaks aren't that great either. It's actually made a mistake here. Um, but we found that it was easier to fix that with the network than it was to get it right at this stage. So that's what we get there. Um, and so the output of that is these little rectangular images around each word or each set of words. And, and we use a, a neural network to, to get the text out of that. And since this is neural network aficionados, I'll give at least a little bit of the intuition of the architecture behind this network. Um, the, the, the image comes in, we have a bunch of convolutional layers, basically because convolutions are, are well known to Kind of give a very good representation of images, right? All the image classification stuff that Dave mentioned is based on confidence. Um, in particular, if you think of OCR, kind of the original application of confidence was um, the MNIST uh, data set of handwritten digits and doing a sort of OCR on that. Um, so we do it, we start with that, and then the output of the convolutional layers goes into this these uh, bidirectional LSTM layers. And that's, um, I, I don't know how much background everyone has, but this is a kind of recurrent layer, which um, which has been used a lot for kind of language <coughs> tasks, uh, translation, um, and it can output a sequence, which is like exactly what we want, a sequence of characters. Um, so we put that on top, and then we have a CTC layer, which uh, kind of normalizes the output of the LSTM. I'm not gonna get too much into that one but it's included for completion. But, but to look at these first two parts again, um, right, so just sort of to explain how this works, right, the image comes in, you put it through a bunch of convolutions, and that gives you this, this feature map, um, just a big matrix of values that you believe are a good representation of the image. And what's, what's important about it being a convolution is that if you look kind of at each part of this, like this column of values is all derived only from this region of pixels, right? So we call this the receptive field of this part of the feature. And this column came from here, right? The next column came from a, an overlapping window, a little bit moved over. And so, you know, practically you do this by pushing the whole image through the ComNet, but really you can think of it as kind of you pushed each of these windows through the ComNet and got a vector describing each one of them. And so that's what then goes into your, your current layers. And so, you know, your sort of hope is that this first thing looks like an A. We have a nice representation of, here, of it here. The LSTM will be able to call that 
an A, right? And then the second one, maybe this looks kind of like an A as well, but the LSTM has fed its state into the next cell. It, it might know that it's already read that A, right? So maybe you just get, you know, there's nothing here. So, I mean, who knows what it's really doing? But that's kind of the idea of why you use this architecture. And then, um, yeah, like I said, there, there is a CTC out here, right? What you really get here is, you know, some probability that this is an A, some probability that it's, it's maybe an E, it's not too far off. And so the CTC kind of optimizes over all the different possibilities to give you a single text output. Okay. So, right, how do you train this thing? Um, it takes a lot of data to train a lot of these neural nets. And um, the, the wonderful thing about the OCR problem is that it's so easy to generate as much data as you could ever want. Um, so we built a system for, for generating data, right? We just, we had a bunch of books and a bunch of text documents, pick out uh, a little string from there. We have tons and tons of fonts. Um, we ran with them. You know, sometimes we put underlines. And then because we're, we're working from real photos, we introduce all these kind of sort of corruptions, right? Like we imagine all these different patterns of shadows that could be on it. Um, we apply a little bit of rotation in case the photos are perfectly straight. And you know, you, you think of a few of these ideas, you train up your network, you see what kind of mistakes it's making, you say, oh, I, I didn't include enough numbers, or oh, I need some of these kind of low fidelity fonts that are on receipts. Um, and you can kind of build up uh, a data set that includes all the kind of things you're interested in. You also have to include some, some negative samples, just you know, in case the word detector fails, the network should recognize that there's no text in something like that. So for training, uh, we generated 11 million of these. You could have more, but it seemed to be we weren't getting um, anything out of having more than that. And then, you know, the, the synthetic data isn't perfect. It doesn't, it's not really like real data. So you, you, we train on the synthetic data. We also collected 20,000 actual boxes, right? We took a, a real photo, ran the detector, and asked humans to label the text that was in them. And we used that to fine tune the network, get, get a little bit of a bump of accuracy at the end. <coughs> Sorry. Um, that's pretty much the whole thing. Uh, the post-processing I mentioned, um, we do have a dictionary. Uh, not everything in the document will be in the dictionary. You know, people take photos of like their tickets with a ticket number. That's not in the dictionary. So our network outputs both the text and the confidence. When it's very confident, we just believe it, even if it's not in the dictionary. If it's not as confident, and you have like two text boxes, they're close to each other, neither thing's in the dictionary, we're not very confident. But if you put them together, then it would be in the dictionary, then you're probably better off making a translation. <coughs> so it's just a little bit of a tweak at the end. Um, so that's the whole thing. Detection rectification, enhancement, OCR, put it into a PDF, then you can search it. Uh, one little bonus that we do is um, you don't have to take the photo with the scan, right? Lots of people just put their photos in Dropbox already. Um, so sort of in the background, we also classify those to recognize whether this looks like a document or not. If it is, we'll, we'll run the detection and we'll offer a little button to kind of turn this one into a PDF. And uh, that's the whole system. Um, if you want more details, you can ask me questions. We've also got a few test blog posts on this. So you can either memorize this or just search for Dropbox, Tech Blog, Dog Scanner, and uh, a few different posts should come up. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, thank you for the talk. Really enjoyed it. So one question I had when you had the mock diagram at the beginning, you showed all the stages, uh -huh. and you had enhancements um, and uh, whatever edge detection, and then at the end came OCR. Right. Uh, what is your thought towards kind of putting that entire? Um, Chain of processing as just like one end to end network, like you see in other domains. Um, certainly, like if I had to answer that question, I'm sure that in the real world, the practical concerns, there are probably like a lot of dirty uh, things that go on, dirty, you know, you have bad data, and sometimes things just don't go well. And so, if you know 
things about the domain you can cut out some of the problems with you know, like right. something, something experience? Yeah, I, I think that's pretty much the intuition. Uh, we didn't start there. I mean, in theory, you can imagine, all right, let's just, we'll, we'll put in a photo and we'll get out the whole text of the whole document and then all that didn't work, so then we start breaking it up. We broke it up from the beginning. Um, I do think we could, I don't know if you could put together the whole thing, but I think we could sort of move in that direction of, of combining some of these stages. Especially, you know, some of them, like I said, are these kind of old-fashioned and actually unlearned computer vision techniques. And, um, and they do pretty well. I mean, people put a lot of thought into developing them, but I, I, I would sort of like to stick more of them together and, and make more of it trainable than, than is now. At least enhancement, because I think enhancement is starting to be harder. Yes, yeah, there, there are some interesting papers. Right? The enhancement is not learned now, but um, I have seen some, some work on sort of learning the parameters that you use to enhance across the image. There's a few lines of color on that too, though. The, the part that does the rectification you talked about that has the learning tech that followed by the top transform, in our offline process, we actually do have an end to end system that does that rectification and the single key tag. However, it's too slow to run on, on the phone in real time because there you want to have a speed interface as well. And so, this part, the right hand part, is an end to end trade network, not a full state part. It does not include the end part. Right. So, right, the detection on the phone has to be very fast, and we use this, this random forest and a lot of cute techniques actually to, to make it faster in the video. Um, if someone's already uploaded the photo, we have lots of server power, and so we, we do the classification and detection using deep networks there. Yes? What parts uh, uh, of the pipeline do you run on the device? Do you run the, uh, so, um, so if, if it's this pipeline, you've uploaded a photo and this happens on the server and this happens, okay, so, sorry, let's start with the original flow. Um, this is on device, this is on device, only this is on the server. Um, and in fact, the, the only thing we see on the server is the output of these two steps. We don't have the original image even. Um, if, you, if you start by just uploading a photo, then we do have the original photo. This runs on the server. We do the detection here because um, this detector is a little bit more accurate than this one because it is a deep net, it is trained, and we do have more CPU behind it. Um, so we'll actually do the detections up front when you upload the image and then we, we download them to the device so you have them ready if, when you uh, do the conversion here. Uh, the enhancement is actually on the device in either case. Yes? Uh, oh, one more? Uh, same two people. <laughs> oh, 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 let's go. Yes, for the OCR, are, are you using the, for example, hidden Markov model, HMM, or, or something else for, for that? Uh, we're not using a heavy Markov model. Um, I guess the LSTM in itself is, is sort of a version of an HMM, right? The, the LSTMs have this hidden state which they pass from one to another and then it produces the output. But um, we don't have any sort of explicit HMM coming after that or anything like that. Uh, shall we move on? Yeah, I think we better move on, but I'll be around if you have any other questions, feel free to ask. Uh, we're going to have one more speaker for the evening. Um, we're going to be talking about satellite photography. Uh, so for those of you who are uh, interested in that, this is going to be right up your alley. So the general goal is to sort of 
do deep learning on satellite images and search it, sort it, find a bunch of things. Um, to give you a sense of, so one of the first applications we, work, we are working on is to do segmentation on satellite images. This is sort of similar image you'll see on Google Earth. Um, so, and Digital Globe is the provider. So, um, this gives you a sense on sort of um, the kind of imagery. Um, let's see. So, the general process we have is we get huge images. So, this is um, over Rio. Um, this is, I think, about 700 square kilometers, something like that. Um, and we train our models. I talk about that more. Uh, but the general part is we sort of get probabilities, red being stronger, we get all of our rows, um, and then we do um, some vectorization, so you sort of break it down into um, edges and lines. We do classical computer vision, even here. Uh, and yeah, so this is sort of my general point. Um, why should we do this is the first question. So there's something called as OpenStreetMap. Uh, for those who are not familiar, um, this is sort of like Wikipedia for maps or crowdsourced um, annotation. So in the middle is what crowd has generated in Syria. Syria, yeah. Um, and of course, we actually look at the image, so it's useful. That's the point. Um, also in North America, for example, OSM is quite accurate. Um, things change. So if you look at this part, um, there's new construction on the bottom left. Um, Google Maps is not updated. So it's sort of the general thesis on why doing this is useful. Um, let me see. So this is another example of why. Um, so this is Santa Rosa before the California fire. We just ran our, oh, by the way, all the examples that we see are sort of part of VALSET. We have never trained on it, on that right stuff. Um, this is pre-fire. Um, and this is post, so on the top right is sort of where the building burned. Um, to sort of prove to you that it burned, this is what it looks like when we zoom in. Um, and we did not have any training examples on burned buildings. Uh, so this is just out of, um, just falls out of our models. Um, the um, last thing is we also do ships. Um, these are the things I can talk about. So I had to run by my founders. Um, and we do basic detection. This is somewhere in um, Trinidad. Um, so it, it, rather than talking about sort of our models, I thought um, we'll, OK, oh, let me talk about this first. Um, so typically, uh, satellite images is sort of broken down into um, meters per pixel. So roughly, each pixel represents how many meters. That's sort of the point. Um, there are really two big data providers. One is Planet Labs, and one is Digital Globe. Um, and typically, the resolution is inversely proportional to the re-entry time, meaning how often you capture the image. So if the resolution is high, then you see it once a quarter, and if the resolution low, you see it more often. Um, Sort of general problems with the data, um, there are lots of them. Um, sort of when the time of the day it's captured, um, the shadows, um, the sensors itself, by the way, uh, have their own quirks, um, and we don't have control over it. We already get the image. Um, one example, just to sort of point out, when there are clouds, there is no way we can find roads, of course. Um, and when there's Foggy clouds. I don't know what it's called, but foggy clouds. Then we get some of, some of the times. Why well, I pick the good one. Sometimes you know. Um, but this is sort of the general problem with the data, um, and why I think it's it has its own unique challenges, and you can't just throw any sort of segmentation algorithm and hope that it'll just work. Um, so I I thought that I'll not talk about all the architecture kind of thing. I'm more than happy to talk about it, but sort of the nuggets that are more useful to us than actual sort of fancy architectures. Um, and these are the three, and I thought I'd talk about them, and please stop me because I'm going brief on them. Well, the funny part is there's this tweet by Andrei Karpati where he says, uh, just stop talking about this and tell me the learning rate, 
uh, I can't. And actually, believe it or not, some people have come and asked me, what's your learning rate? And I, I don't know how that's relevant, but like, this, he's joking, this stuff. don't use this. Uh, so the, the, there are sort of two steps um, in how we do it. Um, first is sort of in your, once you set up your data and once you set up some state-of-the-art network architecture, what's the right learning rate? Or where do you start? Um, I use this often and it sort of works for us quite well is um, on the x-axis you have your durations, on the y-axis you have your learning rate, and you sort of start with some really small number and step it up. Uh, and once you step it up, at some point, so on the right is your learning rate versus loss curve, and at some point you'll sort of see this um, start going up, and this is maybe a good starting point. Um, but of course, you gotta play around. Um, and this, this is, in general, works for us whenever we are trying new architectures, new whatever, as a basic default, we throw this in and does something sensible. Um, the other thing that is really useful for us is these models are big um, and we still try and sort of do ensembling. So there's this technique called of using cyclic learning rate. Um, so the general idea is on the left is your regular um, models. You go across around and you find a local minima and your grade and you sort of go home and take your blue flag as your best model, and that's it. Um, cyclic learning rate sort of um, posits that there are more than one local minima, we sort of know that from lots and lots of papers. Let's try and get hit all of them during one training process. So the point is, you go and hit number one uh, in your local minima space, and then you try and jump out. So you, and then you try and go to another one, and hopefully you get um, more than one sort of um, local minima or good models, uh, whatever that means. Um, and then you can ensemble, or a lot of times it actually gives us half a percent boost in general, just sort of do this. Um, so what this means is um, you find your learning rate range, which is sort of what we did in a couple slides ago, and then you um, cycle your learning rate through. So you go between this and this in, I don't know, five steps, ten steps, something like that. And then you try and do some sort of cycling around. Um, and ideally, during this point, um, you get your local minimas. Um, and this is not new. This, we didn't invent this as a paper about this. Um, but this works quite well. It's actually cheap to get lots of model ensembling in one training. Um, and it seems to also sometimes get us better minima. So in all in all, it's sort of a free trick that anybody um, the next thing that I wanted to talk about, I, I think in general, um, sort of, how do you generate your validation sets? And I'd like to hear from you as well, what do you do? But, um, it, it, how, like, what's, academia is very simple, you have your image net, you have your well set, and you sort of iterate over, you get a number, and you go 0.5% boost, and you publish the paper. Well, in industry, we have ability to collect more and more data. Um, at what point is sort of the cost to, it's not worth getting more data, or at what point, how do you get that data? So we think about this a lot, um, and especially because we do segmentation, annotations are hard, okay, expensive, not hard, but expensive. Um, so one of the things that we have come up with, and it sort of works well, is just start with some random well set, um, find, find low performing samples or hard negative samples, um, and create an embedding um, for all of them. So this is sort of in combination of the deep model that we are training and um, what we know about satellite images. So sensor-based features, think metadata of what kind of sensors did you get, what area, what ge geography, that kind of thing. Um, and handcrafted features, so we also throw in some basic um, handcrafted features, we come up with this big embedding, and then we, we basically have access to all satellite images of every day. And it's um, in the order of, somebody from Planet Lab, they would know, but it's in the order of, 
I think at this point, one photo of every square kilometer of Earth a day. So it's insane the amount of data that we have access to. The question is, what data to annotate best improve our model performance or variability or all of that. And this sort of basic um, strategy works quite well. Um, and we sort of also pepper in um, randomly sampled images because well, it's not perfect and you don't want to mess things up. So I think this is one of the things where, which I think in industries is very industry specific and you don't have the ability to do it in academia. Um, but I can talk more about this. I'm going to be here. Um, the last thing I want to talk about, and I think uh, he touched up on this a bit, is um, receptive field analysis. Um, so for any ConfNet image type world, um, for example, when you do classification or OCR or anything where you have sort of images as input, one of the things that you should think about is the receptive field. So in short, what this means is sort of uh, as you go deeper at what, so this neuron, or neuron, I don't know, this node um, is affected by that region. And that's what receptive field means. Um, what you want to do is uh, try and think about, like, once you do this analysis for your setup, you say for layer at depth x, you have receptive field that looks at x percentage, y percentage of your image. So, like, how do you know if you want to go deeper? How do you know where you add more parameters? The general idea is you want, actually, it turns out we don't need a receptive field that is as big as the image. It doesn't really help. Um, so, that helps us make our model faster because we can reduce the depth. Also, we have some basic understanding on at what resolution of the image the objects exist. So, if I can. I was trying to show buildings. Um, all right. Uh, okay. Um, so think about it. So you saw the example of um, images and the ships. There's a general distribution of ship sizes. They almost never captured the whole image. So we know at what sort of resolution most amount of representation is needed. So we can try and make. Um, we try and do increase the number of thickness at that depth. And that's sort of how we, I don't know, budget our prediction time, um, model parameters, um, in an interesting way, where you sort of figure out what's the resolution that most affects your. And th this is sort of what, uh, for people who don't know what dilated continents, it, it sort of holds in your convolutions. Um, but that's it from me. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So um, we have like a open access to data kind of partnership. So we, uh, I'm trying to. So well, we have access to their data, unlimited. We don't. I was trying. I don't. I can't talk about the business part. So we have access to their data as much as we want, from my perspective. Okay. Like oh, I don't know. What sort of uh, enhancements uh, pre-processing do you do? Um, yeah, yeah, good question. So, um, it, not much. Um, we take the image as is. Um, there is sort of... Um, do you get uh, like extra channels apart from the RGB? Uh, yeah. There are some different channels that the satellite Yeah, 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 yeah. So typically satellite images um, have uh, infrared band, which is about eight channels or 16 channels, depending on what you get. Um, yeah, so we actually try and, um, we tried to use it, um, at least in our applications, it didn't really add much. Um, which just means I'm not good enough, but, uh, you know, or if there's not much to gain from it, at least in our application. So, we don't really use that most of the time.
Yeah, yeah. Um, so um, your question was how do we generate the embeddings beside the meta features? No. Yeah. Um, so I, I mean, this this is sort of uh, current work in progress. Um, I'll tell you what we do. I'm sure that if you have a better answer, I'd like to know. Uh, so we sort of pick um, we build a lightweight model uh, to do basic classification, and then pick. So we actually use VGG, which is uh, and pick an embedding of VGG um, as a deep features. Um, we train on a model and pull five or whatever you want to pick from VGG. That's your deep embedding features. That's it. It's not that complicated. Uh, we, we don't use the model that is used in production on purpose. We keep them kosher. There's some reasons. I can talk about it. Anything else? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, so you know, it looks like we still have a fair amount of food and wine and all that. Um, so please drink that, so we don't have to take it home. Or actually, I don't know what Dropbox does with that, so maybe they have to take it home. But uh, and yeah, I think we have the space until um, David. When do you want to kick us out of here? Any time is fine. Just let me know. Yeah, right. <laughs> I guess it's 8.30 now, so. Yeah, so everybody hang out, you know, and uh, yeah, around 9, shut down. But, uh, you know, thank you so much, everybody, for coming. And uh, we'll all be walking around. So if you have any questions, uh, feel free to come up and ask. Right, thanks.